Welcome. Two lectures back, we looked at the revolutions of agriculture and iron in Africa. One way of defining a revolution might be to say that it, it changes the scope of, of possibility. It changes the, the, the range of potential. And one way of assessing the outer limits of the range of possibility is to look at an extreme case, to ask just how far could the changes go. This brings us to ancient Egypt. There's nothing quite like ancient Egypt. Uh, the subject certainly could be uh, the focus of an entire teaching company course, and lo and behold, it is. That'll be the last commercial I do for, uh, for another course, but uh, it's a good one. Now, although Egypt lies outside of our course's uh, self-assigned area of coverage, that is, sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt's history, and really even more relevant, I think, today, the greatly varying approaches to Egypt's history have played such vivid roles in interpretations, in, in controversies about world history and about African history that we simply cannot ignore it. So this will be uh, one of our discursions uh, beyond sub-Saharan Africa. For nearly 3,000 years, the lower Nile Valley in Egypt Despite numerous dynastic changes, something like 30 different dynasties, despite the fact that people talk about the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, the new kingdom, for something like 3,000 years, ancient Egypt demonstrated, displayed an essential, a basic political and cultural continuity. That's rather incredible. If you compare that longevity with Rome, or the longevity, the age of, of the American nation, for instance. It's, it dwarves it. Egypt's achievements in art, literature, science, perhaps above all in architecture, continued to, to astound us. Now, the ultimate basis, however, of the Egyptian wonder was an incredible leap in agricultural productivity along the Nile. The key to that, of course, was the annual flood of the Nile. Atop the rich deposits of silt, comparatively limited amounts of labor could yield previously unthinkable amounts of agricultural wealth. The people who produced that wealth were peasant farmers. In this course, I will simply use the term peasant to refer to small-scale farmers. You know, we, we pay so much attention to the spectacular things coming out of Egypt, the splendors of it, and understandably so, usually associated with the elite, if not the pharaohs, at least the, the thinkers, the mathematicians, the architects, the, the creators of these wonders, that we perhaps are in some danger of overlooking the people who, almost literally in this sense, were at, at the base of the, of, the, of the pyramid, in this case, the social pyramid. Peasant farmers produced this enormous uh, uh, agricultural wealth. They were poor, obviously not because they weren't producing much, but because the surplus which they produced was, of course, regularly siphoned upwards uh, through, through taxation. And here again, the particular uh, characteristics of a river and environment made a difference. The Nile River Valley, the populated portions of the Nile River Valley, of course, comparatively, actually quite by any standard, very narrow. It also is a river which is quite navigable, upstream and down. The prevailing winds blow upstream, so you can take those to, to move up. Uh, the, the river flow, on the other hand, of course, obviously, is, is downstream. Now, the narrowness of that valley and the navigability of the river meant 
that it was possible for the Pharaoh's agents, the scribes and the tax collectors, to reach these producers, these peasant producers, on a very regular basis. In fact, I'm sure to many peasants it was an overly regular, uh, regular basis. After all, every phase of the agricultural cycle was, was in a sense regulated or monitored, perhaps is the better word, by these uh, agents, the bureaucrats, basically, of the, the Egyptian state. Uh, quotas, in essence, were set for peasant producers based on the, the size or the, the scale of the annual Egyptian flood, and therefore producers were assigned a particular level of surplus which they were expected to produce. And the consequences of not producing it uh, were usually, at the very least, uh, corporal uh, punishment. So the siphoning of this and the, the geographical factors which made it possible to siphon this surplus is ultimately what underlay these grand projects which we still find so, so captivating. Now, perhaps surprisingly, Egypt in its heyday did not, in fact, employ iron tools. But it certainly had metallurgy. It made extensive use, or people made extensive use of copper and eventually bronze tools, bronze a, a, an alloy of, of copper and tin. And its expertise in metallurgy is shown also, of course, in the legendary Egyptian gold. Such was Egypt's prosperity and the resultant population increase that it is possible that at the kingdom's height, half of all people living in Africa resided here. Half the people on the continent may have been part of ancient Egypt at its height. Now the idea of civilization and related questions of the origin of civilization have embroiled Egypt in controversy for a very long time precisely because it seems to embody so much of the very concept of civilization. I'm going to take a, a slight personal digression here. I rarely use the term civilization. I'm not terribly comfortable with it. To me, it's a word that is so laden with the possibilities of misunderstanding and frankly, one often loaded with what could only be called bias that I often find it unuseful. I think that all too often the dichotomy between civilization versus barbarism or civilization versus uh, savagery is equated with a dichotomy essentially between us and them. Who are the civilized? Well, obviously we are. What are they like? Well, obviously they are uncivilized, they are barbaric and what have you. Now I want to quickly add here that this is not simply, you know, some sort of politically correct attack on, on the Western world, although I think what I just mentioned has a history there. I don't think I have to go into great depth to suggest that there are certainly people in the world today who see themselves as the repository of civilization and see the Western world as the repository of savagery. So it's not exclusive to one place or one, one time, one culture, this us, them, civilized versus uncivilized kind of dichotomy. Just to extend that problem I have with it uh, a little bit further, suppose we extended the, the term civilization just a bit and, and talked about civilized behavior, for instance. Um, hmm. Take a country in, in Europe, Germany, and again, this is not an effort to pick on any particular place. You know, Germany has been the home of, of people like Bach, Goethe, Einstein, creators of fantastic uh, achievements in, in culture and science and, and literature. Products, many would say, of the highest of civilizations. Germany, of course, also produced Adolf Hitler. It produced the Holocaust. Where does that leave us in terms of 
the relationship or analysis of the relationship between civilization and civilized behavior. Again, I'll take it a bit further personally. Most uh, I, I, I have spent more time in one particular part of Africa than any other, and that's the area of southern Zambia uh, dominated by Tonga peoples, Tonga-speaking peoples. Now, the Tonga historically did not build pyramids. They did not have literacy. And yet, in terms of my own experiences, I've certainly encountered a wealth and abundance of behavior I can only call civilized from that kind of culture, from those people. Okay, enough for my personal digression. There may be ways to take some of the, you know, some of the emotion, some of that, that tilt, one way or the other, out of a concept of civilization. If we go to a source like, uh, you know, the Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences and look up civilization, we'll get something that is a much, I think, more useful kind of objective set of criteria that they are using to, to, uh, to define the, the, the very concept. In its most literal sense, civilization, for instance, refers to the presence of cities. Do we have urban life? Do people live, were, were cities of some size uh, emergent? Did they develop there? Literacy, obviously a characteristic that many would point to in a more, as I say, objective sense or way of defining uh, civilization. And some may go on to that. Monumental architecture may, may figure as, a, as a, a, a criterion for civilization or an extensive and elaborate division of labor, some would say. I think we ought to back up, though, maybe, and, and just mention that the prerequisite for urban life is, of course, agricultural life. Without the agricultural production to feed cities, civilization, in this sense, is, is impossible. Now, was Egypt the fount of, of Western civilization? Was Greece possible without Egypt? Was Greece fundamentally different from Egypt? Was Greece, as some would have it, a copy of, of Egypt? I must say that in entering this question of the relationship between ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, we are entering a bit of a minefield here, and I think within a few minutes uh, you, may, you may see why. Now, over the, the long course of, of time, the pendulum in, in the Western world has certainly swung back and forth a number of times in terms of this, this relationship between Egypt and, and Greece. And when I say it has swung back and forth, I mean it has it gone from contentions that Egypt was extraordinarily important as an influence on Greece, or in the extreme case that Greece simply amounted to an echo or, or a copy of it, to contentions that Greece was something fundamentally different and that in fact Western civilization needs to be traced back to there and stop there. That's uh, something fundamentally different was represented uh, across the Mediterranean in ancient, in ancient Egypt. Now, it's, the pendulum has swung not only over time. This division, if you like, of approaches to, to Egypt's role in the long run of Western civilization certainly continues today. I mean, consider a couple of, of fairly recent publications. Martin Bernal's uh, multi-volume work entitled Black Athena, very provocative title there. And as you might expect, he is arguing at, at some length and with some subtlety that in fact the, the roots of classical Greek uh, civilization were to be found uh, in, in Africa and, and in Asia. Another book by, by Mary Lefkowitz, uh, largely created or assembled in response to Bernal and, and others, has an equally provocative title. It says, Not Out of Africa, is the title of the book. So stressing that, in fact, uh, the, the course of, of so-called Western civilization uh, is something uh, quite fundamentally different, and that, that Egypt owed relatively little, excuse me, that, that that Greece owed relatively little uh, to, to Egypt. Now, those who would support Bernal, Ber Bernal's position that, that Egypt did owe a great deal to, excuse me, that Greece did owe a great deal to, to Egypt, 
do have some contemporary, by which I mean ancient sources, that they can turn to. And one of them is usually considered the father of history, again, in the Western tradition. And that is Herodotus, who not only wrote a great deal of history uh, about the whole ancient world, but spent some time in Egypt in about 450 uh, BC. I just quote him uh, for a moment here on Herodotus on, on, on religion. He wrote that the names of nearly all the gods came to Greece from Egypt. These practices, and he's referring to religious practices then, and others I will speak of later were borrowed by the Greeks from Egypt. Now, here is where the modern obsession with race enters the arena. A century ago, prominent American scholars went to Egypt. They examined uh, Egyptian crania, that is, skulls, and they pronounced that these were Caucasian, that they were white, in other words. In other words, they were making the case that Egypt, the fount of Western civilization, almost by definition, therefore, was white, and now we've proved it. In 1926, a major Egyptologist published a book in which he stated flatly that the Egyptians were part of his term, the great white race. Now, in more recent decades, as you might expect, a counter-argument has, has definitely emerged. And it goes something like this, that Egypt was not just African. It was black African. This has become a central tenet of some strains, not all, of what in the last couple of decades has been called Afrocentrism or Afrocentrism. One of the founders, in a sense, although he never called himself that, of the entire approach to Egypt that that represents was the Senegalese scholar from, from West Africa, Sheikh Anta Diop. I'll just give you one sentence from him, or a couple of sentences actually, uh, that states uh, his conclusion. He, he published a book, by the way, in the late 1950s uh, called The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. As you can no doubt deduce, uh, he certainly answered that it was reality, okay? The ancient Egyptians were Negroes. The moral fruit of their civilization is to be counted among the assets of the black world. Now, you can see from that that Jop and his followers not only ascribe an enormous influence from Egypt towards Greece, but an enormous influence from Egypt towards the rest of, of Africa, in a sense that the ancient Nile Valley in, in Egypt bears the same relationship to African civilization as Greece and Rome would to Western civilization. So, let me try to navigate this, this minefield uh, a bit. My own view starts with what I might presumptuously call some common sense. It's important to distinguish between modern Egypt and ancient Egypt. Today, Egypt is seen, properly seen, as a central part, some would say the central part, of the Arab world. But the full-scale Arab invasions and permanent occupations of Egypt did not begin until after the Prophet Muhammad's death in the 7th century AD. This is a thousand years after ancient Egypt's fall. In general, people's skin color closer to the equator was darker and farther from it, lighter. Now, this might suggest that Egypt's original population, if we could identify such, was, on average, somewhere between the averages in Central Africa and, say, Central Europe. Maybe a, a phrase like people of color is more useful than black versus white. Egypt was at a crossroads of Africa, the Mediterranean, and Southwest Asia. It is reasonable to expect that peoples of various origins live there. And indeed, the, the representations out of Egypt, and by that I mean the, the, the paintings, drawings, the sculptures, etc., appear to represent a great range, a great variety of what modern uh, uh, people would call races. Now, maybe most important of all, there's good evidence that people in ancient Egypt did not 
think of racial categories in the way that modern peoples have. That conceptions of blackness or whiteness or of the black race or white race were simply not uh, part of their, their lexicon. We run, therefore, the constant risk of imposing classifications on peoples who didn't necessarily see that things that way uh, at all. I find myself in agreement with uh, Eric Gilbert and Jonathan Reynolds, uh, authors of uh, another recent textbook, who I'm paraphrasing, but they, they say that essentially asking the question, who were the ancient Egyptians, which I would amend to say asking the question, what color were the ancient Egyptians, reveals more about ourselves than the answer reveals about the Egyptians. I'll end this section by saying that Egypt is indisputably part of the African continent. That does not require divorcing it from the Mediterranean world or the world of the Near East. These are not either or categories, they're not either or issues. Egypt can be both and, both part of the African world and part of the Mediterranean world as it is part of the Arab world. Okay. Now, to seek a firmer link between Egypt and the rest of Africa, let's look upstream. Let's look south on the Nile River. Let's extend our Nile purview beyond pharaonic uh, ancient Egypt. And let's move into the area historically known as Nubia. Uh, it's now the, the northernmost parts of the modern country of, of Sudan. I'm going to turn first to the, the findings of uh, the archaeologists uh, from the University of Chicago, led by Bruce Williams, who carried out certainly the most extensive researches in and about ancient Nubia uh, that we have, have seen and began to publish these in the late 1980s. Now, what they found, I'm, I'm going to go particularly to their very earliest uh, findings, or, the, or I should say the findings from the very earliest period that they survey, uh, surveyed which ran from 3800 B.C. to 3100 B.C. Now, I mentioned those dates. This is a case where chronology may indeed really make a difference here. 3800 B.C. leading up to 3100 B.C. 3100 B.C. is used the conventional date for the start of the founding of uh, the ancient Egyptian uh, dynasties. Now, what Williams and his teams found, they have argued in uh, numerous publications, was by, through the excavation and exploration, for instance, of royal tombs and cemeteries, is what, in his phrase, uh, he calls a lost kingdom called Tasseti, or Land of the Bow, again, well upstream of ancient Egypt, and perhaps most important of all, predating it. Williams argues that ideas like divine kingship, in other words, may have originated further into Africa than uh, previously believed, and that therefore the movement of ideas like divine kingship, uh, the notion of the state-building impulse, if you like, moved from the south and into Egypt from that direction. Now, as you might imagine, this also remains uh, controversial. As it happens, after 3100 uh, BC, as Egypt is rising, these very areas of Nubia that, that Williams was uh, excavating uh, fell into to some decline. Still, there was a revival. About 2000 BC, that is about 4,000 years ago, a major kingdom centered at Kerma on the Nile emerged in Nubia. Cush, as this and its successor states came to be called, was the second oldest state at least in Africa, if Williams is right, perhaps the third oldest state uh, in, in all of Africa. Over a period of 2,000 years or so then, relations between Kush and Egypt, economic relations, political relations, cultural relations, were substantial and they were complex. There were several swings of the power pendulum. Egypt occupied Kush at times, but Around 750 BC, the Nubians from Kush invaded Egypt and ruled it for nearly a century. This is the 25th of the 30 or so dynasties in the Egyptian progression, and it's usually called the Nubian dynasty 
of Egypt. In some ways, the Kushites showed considerable Egyptian influence. They built pyramids, for instance. They're not uh, on the, quite the size of, of the Egyptian ones, but they're, they're most impressive nonetheless. Their kings referred to themselves as, as pharaohs. Their religion, in a lot of respects, was very similar, and some of the named deities, like Amun and so forth, show up in, uh, in the Kush, Kushite uh, history as well. In other respects, on, on the other hand, Kush was, was quite independent. It developed its own alphabetic script, and this script is actually still undeciphered, an extremely complex script, which differed fundamentally from uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now, in the centuries leading up to the the modern era, the, the birth of Jesus, the, uh, up to 1 AD, in the early centuries uh, a, uh, BC, the capital of Kush shifted to the south within Nibia, uh, uh, Nubia and came to be located at the city of, of Meroe, uh, between the Nile and the Atbara rivers, at the junction of those two rivers. And it's here that we do find uh, one of our, our old revolutions. Meroe became an iron production site of the first importance in tracing the history of iron and ironworking throughout Africa. One scholar called it the Birmingham of Central Africa. Given Meroe's very wide trading contacts, it's reasonable to view it as an important center for iron knowledge diffusion. Now, eventually, Meroe appears to have declined, for instance, in the production of its iron, partly because the, the rather limited woodland uh, around this area, which after all is, is nearby, contingent, or, or next door to the uh, portions of the Sahara, the woodland was, was exhausted, and the woodland was particularly important in creating the charcoal which produced the heat which allowed the smelting of iron to, to take place. Its final fall, though, actually came at the hands of Ethiopia, known as Aksum then, when King Izana uh, conquered it and spelled an end to Meroe's old iron industry. We will meet King Izana again in our lecture on Ethiopia a couple of steps down the road. Through Kush, then, we find a credible link between ancient Egypt and Africa to the south. Kush and Egypt influenced one another. Egypt influencing Kush, Kush influencing Egypt. Egypt influenced Kush, and Kush in turn had effects through its trading links with Africa to the south. In essence, the prosperity of Old Meroe, Old Kush, was based on its middleman position. It was able to take advantage of the commerce from inner Africa to the south and the Mediterranean world to its north. We will see rather quickly other so-called middleman trading kingdoms. When we look in Lecture 10 at the rise of the old savannah states of West Africa, I'll end this consideration of Egypt and Kush by quoting the eminent historian Roland Oliver of the University of London on Kush, who concluded that it was indeed, quote, the prototype of the later states of the sub-Saharan savanna. Thank you.